You can't get away from that. You get out in the wilderness and some plane on you. Okay. It's a great pleasure to be here with Professor Jean Odom from the University of Georgia. Professor Odom, your name is synonymous with ecology. Can you tell us about your background, please? Well, I uh, grew up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It was a small town at that time. My father was a professor, and I was rather uh, <coughs> timid, and I didn't think I wanted to be a professor. I think all children tried. So, so I decided I wanted to be a plumber or engineer or something of that sort. <laughs> Turned out later what I'm doing is looking at the plumbing of nature. In other words, so uh, <coughs> a usual history, I, I got interested in birds and used to spend a lot of time in the woods and got to know the birds pretty well. Now I realize you don't understand anything like a bird or a piece. You have to you have to know the whole. So I got interested in the whole environment in which birds live, you see. And so from that you go from the individual uh, interests, you might say, and you go to a bigger level. And then now, of course, we're talking global. <laughs> and ecology has sort of had the same history. And we started out being like nat natural history looking at and things of that sort. And when I went to the University of Georgia in uh, 1940, 60 years ago, um, ecology was thought to be a very unimportant division of biology. It wasn't uh, considered something you might take after you've taken all the other biology courses. And <coughs> we, we had a little, <coughs> a little uh, um, staff meeting, and we said, what should every biologist take, you know, what core curriculum? We always talk about that, you know. What, and, and I suggested naively at that time that ecology would, ought to be something that every biologist should take. And they looked at me in great stun, you know, stun. Look, what's that? <laughs> and he said, that, there's no science there because there are no principles. You see, it's, it, they misunderstood what, what ecology ought to be. Ecology studied the whole house, you see. And they thought it was a, and this natural history, you know, going out and describing, collecting, and things like that. And so that, that's what inspired me to write the book, Fundamentals of Ecology, which was published in 53. And then I had a hard time finding a publisher because all the publishers said, we've looked at all the catalogs of the, all the colleges and universities in the, in the United States, and there's not a one college that teaches ecology. Now, now there's plant ecology and the, and the animal, insect ecology and the animal ecology, but there's no general ecology. And my point is that we ought to have some principles that apply to everything. Doesn't matter whether it's plants, animals, microbes, or whatnot. And so we, I started writing down these principles. So my book has an unusual organization that students like, where you have a, a principle and you have a statement, sort of a sound bite, you see, a little brief statement that you can read. Then you have a little explanation, then you have examples. So the book has this organization of statement, uh, illustrations, examples. And uh, <coughs> it, uh, it it didn't really, uh, it, it was, of course, it was, it, it, there was nothing in the field. I had the field of myself there for a while. And as the people began to, to <laughs> teach more ecology and so on. And then in 1970, of course, when the astronauts got out and took pictures of the Earth, like you heard today, uh, then that, that was when we had worldwide awareness. That's when we had first Earth Day and all of that. And uh, my book was the only one, and all of a sudden the sales of the book <laughs> shut up. <laughs> because everybody, what, what's this? What's ecology? So long story short, ecology has emerged now from biology. It's no longer a subdivision of biology, although this, this AIBS is about biology. But <laughs> ecology is, is, is a discipline all its own. In other words, it's, it's got its roots, its roots. But see, ecology now is not just about organisms. It's really a three-way interface. It's organisms, that's important. And there's a physical environment, particularly energy. And then there's people, human. King. So, so that we, we're looking now that ecology is a subject which involves the inter interaction, interfacing, and so on, of people, uh, physical environment, and so on. And <laughs> early, in connection with my younger brother, we made energy as a basic. Energy is a basic for everything. And so <laughs> we try now, you see, to get to use e energy as a currency instead of money, you see, because in, in, you can evaluate nature services. We hear a lot about goods and services of nature, and so they can be evaluated by, by uh, using a common denominator energy. 
uh, my brother and I have a little paper, three three page paper summarizing all that in the new journal called Ecosystems is a new journal. So, so uh, essentially ecology is increasing the scale. And then that, that's problems because when you get to the big scale, you can't be real exact. You see, so people ask Mr. Mr. Scientist, is it we're really having global warming? And we'll, you see, we'll have to say, well, we think so, but we're not real sure, you know. And so the public says, poo poo, their science don't know anything. You see, so they don't pay attention to it. <laughs> Very interesting because just as you recounted, I was given the assigned your textbook, I think in the 1970s, mm -hmm. a yellow cover. Was it always with a yellow cover? That was the third edition. Yeah, the, the first one was red, and the second was green, the third one was yellow. <laughs> yeah, that, that and edition. for that many years, it yeah. was the only text in ecology. That's true. You yeah. helped to define the field. Yeah, a lot of, them, a lot of most people teach ecology as evolutionary biology, which is all right. But that's not, that's not that's just part of it, mm -hmm. and people who te who think ecology is just evolution. <laughs> First, second thing, see, human beings are no longer under natural selection, so the study of evolution of the past doesn't help us at all, because we we go take we recreate our genome, and we, we we don't select people, we keep all that misfits alive, and so on and so forth. So we have to go another step above that, but. but yeah. You mm -hmm. talked about ecosystem services just a moment ago. Yeah. What are some of the services that we get from these ecosystems? Eating, drinking, and breathing. Breathing and drinking. You see, we don't pay any money for that. We call these non-market services. And we have to either get them in the market or give them some value. You see, you can't live uh, more than two, three minutes without breathing. And you can't live very long without water. I expect right now water, clean, quality of fresh water is a big limiting factor and so on. Uh, our, our, our prediction, we have a, Gary Barrett and I have an article coming out in, in the bioscience, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, but, <coughs> and we, we, our prediction is, see, uh, there are two kinds of growth. There's, there's what we call the exponential growth, very fast, very rapid, like Atlanta or, or, or Washington. They're growing very, very fast. And there's the control growth that you see you see both kinds of media, but the control growth is where you start leveling off before you reach some limit. Uh, but, so what we say is the human mindset is uh, is so oriented to fast growth that we go. What we're going to have is we're going to go too far, and then we're going to have to downsize. So we we predict in the future we're going to have many booms and busts, and it's all right. Humans are pretty good at getting. Out, we're awful good at getting out of trouble, you know. <laughs> we get ourselves in a mess, you know, and we sometimes get. So the population, you see, the earth will grow, grow too big. I don't think $12 billion can, nobody can have a quality of life for that many people if they have the demands that we have. And so we, we'll go up maybe to 10, and then we'll downsize, and we'll have a negative population growth. So, so our, our prediction is that boom and then bust, and then we'll come back to a, what we call the optimum, you see, where you don't live on the edge. If you're living on the edge and anything happens like a, a drought, then everybody starves. So you, you, you don't want to be right on the maximum, you see. You want to, so, so the optimum is always less than the maximum, and people can understand that. You know, there's a point where too much of a good thing is, that's what we have now. We have too many cars, they're good things. We have too many people, they're good things. But when you get too many of them, then that's that's worse than having not enough. So that's that's our general message. Yes. Yeah. Your field has changed tremendously. What were the most significant changes in the field of ecology over your career? Well, just that getting getting ecology to be, go beyond biological science. It's not not, not it's not a see the word comes from Greek word arkos, which is household. And so we're now treating ecology the way it should be, according to the name. It's a study of the whole household. And see, most, most science is going the other way. Most science is going reductionist. In fact, in many biology departments, ecology, ecologists are no longer welcome. It's all reduction, molecular, and genetic, which is fine. But that's it's like Lynn Margulov said today, you know, that, that's, that's an important part. But then, you know, you don't want to continue to uh, more and more study of less and less, you see. So also, so ecology has a tremendous, you see, uh, importance here to put the pieces together. And when you put the pieces together, we get what we call emergence. 
you know, is if you put uh, or complex systems that everybody talking about today. A uh, complex system is something you can't understand just by understanding the pieces. You might know everything about every species and everything about that, but when you put them together, the new properties pop up. A good example is water. It's oxygen, hydrogen, very reactive stuff. You put them together in a certain way, you get, you get water which has no its properties, nothing at all like hydrogen, oxygen. And so, if you want to study water, do you study hydrogen, oxygen? No, you study water. You see, so so we have to get get the idea is that <laughs> we uh, scientists scientists tend to work on little pieces, and and uh, as I said, you can be more precise the smaller your thing is. When you get to the big picture, you can't be precise. And so people don't understand that, and they expect us to be very precise. You know, yeah, you have global warming. Well, there's a lot of things that are cooling there. And putting up all these aerosols, you know, and, and cutting out the sun, and so uh, we think we're warming, but we're not sure that we so. So, so that this, this is a new level of science where you have to have different criteria and so on. And the main thing is exciting to me is getting people in. Of course, my father was a sociologist, so I, I came out of come by this naturally. His famous book was Southern Regions, in which he tried to show what was wrong with the South. Ask the question, why is the South doing so poorly? And the answer is fairly simple. And of course, segregation was not helping us. And then we had the world's worst farming, you know, ruined all of it. All of our soil disappeared. And then we had no, no high quality education. I, you had to go out of the South to get an education, a PhD, for instance. No, there was no, no single school in the South at the time. So we were real pleased, you know, that in a recent survey, our ecology group at Georgia is number five in the nation. So people are coming out to us <laughs> because we didn't have any ivy on the wall. So we could, <laughs> we could develop a new, new way of looking at things. Whereas if you're Yale and Harvard and so on, you have to wait till all the <laughs> prima donnas die before you can get in there. Whereas when I went to Florida, I mean Georgia, there was nobody there but the young people, most of whom was planning to leave sometime <laughs> because the school wasn't very good. So we learned to get outside money. So we had the, what we call satellite program. We still do. We have a Savannah River program. At Savannah, we have a big program on the coast, Marine Road. We have Coweta, which is a big uh, marine, uh, watershed laboratory. So by getting money from outside, then we could bring in new people and build up, build up a staff that you couldn't afford if you just depended on the inside money. So it's so a little, little bit of a financial management comes in there. Mm -hmm. Just uh, earlier in the conversation, you talked about how ecology now wasn't such an easy time for the field. What would be your advice to ecologists uh, to uh, strengthen the field? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, the exciting thing now is for and it is for people from other dis I guess, let's put it this way. Ecology is exciting now because it interfaces so well. They all say ecological economics. You see there's new, new, new journals, new, new books and everything, and new ways of thinking about that. And then there's uh, ecotoxicology, you see. And then there's uh, agroecology, all of these things we've had to work in. In other words, uh, the new agriculture, you see, must be uh, preserved the soil rather than mining the soil, you see. And we have to, uh, we have a whole, whole new way, way of doing things we call conservation agriculture and so on. And so to get into the interfaces, in other words, the, the college is exciting because we need and we draw from almost any other discipline, including the humanities and the social sciences, you see. In Georgia, we are now have, we're going to have a new umbrella school called School of Environment. Not environmental science, environment. That leaves it open for anthropologists and sociologists, and they, and they will have some special money only for people who want to to cross boundaries. So crossing boundaries now has to be it because there, let's put it this way, uh, no real world problem can be solved by any one discipline, period. The economists can't do it, they're ruining it because the market system does not give any value to the non-market uh, ecosystem services. So we have to we, we have to get work together with them to expand the economy to give value to what's what we call life support services. 
you see, not not paying any much for water, just pay for pumping it. We we, we don't we don't appreciate it. We don't pay anything for air. You see, so either we got to put prices on it, and already of course water we're going to be having to raise the price of water uh, as they do in the West already because we waste it. We have to have lawns that don't need watering. Things like that. You have perfectly good lawn without water, or you need any watering. It's a kind of grasses and ground cover and dandelions, things like that. <laughs> Pretty, and I, I think the green manicured lawn is ugly to me. <laughs> People think you must have, you must. See, we got the human traditions that we have to, that we're going to have to change. It's been such a great pleasure to talk with you today. Yeah, Thank you so much. Enjoyed it so much.